Kathy Reichs is the author of a mystery series featuring forensic anthropologist Temperance Brennan that debuted in 1997 with Deja Dead. There are now over 20 books in the series. During this period, Reichs also held on to her day job as a forensic anthropologist consulting in both Montreal and North Carolina, where her books are set, as well as exhuming mass graves in Guatemala, assisting in the recovery at the World Trade Center after the 9-11 attacks, and aiding in the identification of war debt from World War II, Korea, and Southeast Asia. Kathy Reichs is one of only 100 forensic anthropologists ever certified by the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. She was a producer on the hit television show Bones, which was based on her work. That's extremely impressive, and uh, you know, that you, to, to do that much writing and continue to do the scientific work is kind of amazing. What drew you to the field of forensic anthropology to begin with? What, what, what made you want to study that field? Well, actually, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I kind of got pulled into it. Um, I trained in bioarchaeology, which is excavating and analyzing ancient human remains. The paleopathology and paleoepidemiology of two lower Illinois River Valley Hopewellian populations. Has anybody read that? <laughs> I, I missed that one. I'm sorry. That was my dissertation. My mother read it. But <laughs> <laughs> that was my dissertation. So I was very happily working um, at UNC Charlotte in my lab, working on old materials, when um, police started bringing cases to me. I, I tell the story of this um, in the book, The Bone Collection. It's the collection of shorts uh, for, well, I'm not so good at the short part of short stories. So my short stories tend to be more like novellas. But there's one in there which is an origin story. It's called First Bones. And it, it describes this, um, th my entree into, into the field. And it happened in just that way with police showing up and saying, we've got this skeleton and you know, would you take a look at these bones? And um, so I liked it. I, I really liked the, the relevance. Uh, not that archeology span isn't relevant, but if you're wrong, you'll get into long debates in the literature with your colleagues, and you're not going to impact anyone's life. Whereas with forensics, you are. When you identify um, a set of remains or when you testify in court, you are, and you better be right. So I really liked that. I liked the relevance of it, and I retrained, and I became board certified and switched over. So, so there was a period of time when you were still kind of doing the, the stuff that you had done your dissertation on and that kind of thing, and the police were coming to you kind of on an ad hoc basis. Yeah. What was that like the very first time? Did you, did you, did you, was it unexpected, or you heard other people in your position being asked to do this kind of thing? I had heard of others doing it. Um, I did part of my dissertation, re actually that's not true. I, as an undergrad, I took courses at, I went to, um, hello, American University, in Washington, D.C., and took courses at the Smithsonian. So I was aware of my major professor there. Uh, the FBI or um, local law enforcement would bring cases to the physical anthropologists there. So I was aware of people doing it, but it was just not something that was on my radar to do And until this. And I remember my first case. I absolutely remember it was a child. It's exactly as I describe in this. Uh, well, actually, it's a little bit different. But um, <laughs> I remember the, the case. A little girl went missing. And I, it, I had a little girl at the time, same age, five-year-old, I think, at the time. And I remember thinking about this child out there. In, it, there was a thunderstorm that night. And she was missing. And is she out there in a storm? And is she afraid? And you know, three months went by, and then they find this little skeleton in the woods, and um, that was the first case I remember working on. When you were starting in this field, were there, were there a lot of women in the field, or were you kind of a trailblazer in that way, or how would you describe that? that yeah, I don't, you know, I had, a journalist asked me this early in my career, and I had no idea. So we got down the list of board-certified forensic anthropologists and counted. And at that time, it was about three to one, men to women, which is not bad. And I think that's because it's an academically based discipline. A lot of us are at universities or museums. 
some forensic specialties. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences is made up of um, different sections. There's the, the, the dent, forensic dentists, and there's the forensic um, engineers, and the forensic psychiatrists, and the forensic, uh, you get it. Anyway, some of them, like the forensic dentists at that time, were 99 to 1 men versus women. So anthropology wasn't quite as bad, but it was male dominated. Mm -hmm. so, you're, so now you've gotten board certified, you're working with the police on these different cases, often people who have been missing for a long time or remains, maybe you have no idea when you first start who they could be, and you're, you're solving cases. How did you decide to write a book? Was there a case that said, I, I've got to record this as a book, or was it just a number of things? How did you decide to write that first book? Well, a number of things came together. I started Deja Dead which was the first book. I started it um, in 94, um, and a number of things had come together. First of all, I was promoted to a uh, full professor at the university, which is the highest rank at a university. So um, I could pretty much do whatever I wanted to do, and I didn't feel like writing another textbook or a journal article. Um, I had just finished working on a serial murder case that had some very interesting elements to it, we can talk about that if you want, uh, dismemberment elements to it. And also my kids were getting older and talking about universities and where they wanted to go and none of them had any interest whatsoever in a state university. They all wanted to go to private schools, of course. Um, and I, yeah, even though I live in North Carolina and we have one of the best, you know, nope, can't go there. I don't know if you know this, but university professors are not overly well paid. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. So um, I had a colleague who was writing uh, paperback romance novels, and I, she was making a little income on the side doing that, and I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll try that. So um, I read one of hers, and I thought, yeah, I think I can probably do this. So <laughs> not, not a w romance novel, but um, so that all came together, and um, it took two years because I didn't talk about it. I didn't, outside of the house. Um, and, you know, if you write a novel in the English department, you're a hero, but if you write a novel in a science department, you're a little bit suspect. <laughs> so I didn't tell my chairman or anyone at the university until I'd actually sold it to a publisher. So it took two years. I wrote it early in the morning, and I'm not a dawn riser, but I would get up at 6 o'clock and I would write for a couple hours before going on campus. And during vacations and summer and, you know, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, that kind of thing. Well, and Deja Dead is quite a book. It's, it's a pretty long book. Um, I'm and not good at short, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but, it, it's, but you, your character, Temperance Brennan, in that book is fully formed. You know, that she, she hits the ground running. You really hit the ground running in that series. Um, and it's set in Montreal, and it is this serial killer and these kind of grisly murders. And I guess, how did you make the decision on how grisly to make it? Is that just based on a case you had, or did you think, this is what's going to sell, I've got to make some more money like the romance novelists? <laughs> It is grisly. What do you mean, kind of grisly? These were not kind <laughs> well, you know, of I, grisly. I, These I, were I, grisly. When I was reading it, my wife said, how do you like the book? I said, I, I like it, but, you know, I like my women whole rather than cut up, though. <laughs> so. Well, it is based on an actual case. You can Google it. It's Serge Archambault. Um, he had killed, uh, how did that go? He had killed two women and mutilated, stalked, he kept notebooks, he stalked women, killed two of them, he was, and, but they were discovered very quickly after they'd been killed, so that would not be an anthropology case, those were fresh, regular autopsy cases. But after the second woman, he used her bank card at a teller machine to draw money out, and so the police went back to that little store, and there was a video recording, and they showed it to the owner, and he said, well, I don't know him, but the guy comes in here, all the time, so they staked out the store, and sure enough, our hero showed up, and they arrested him, and he admitted to having killed a third woman two years earlier, cut her up, and buried her in five locations on the opposite side of the St. Lawrence River. So that's the case I was involved in, and it, was, it had some very unique elements of um, dismem dismemberment, 
that I thought would make the good basis for, for a story. So. Well, well, I think you were right. So it made a great basis for a story. <laughs> but so. I change all the names. I change all the details f for both legal and ethical reasons. I don't, yeah. And I don't use anything that's not out there. Even though I do base some of my stories on real cases, it's already out there in the form of uh, court records or um, in the media, newspapers, whatever. So. So in that one, and in many of the other books, um, Temperance really gets out into the field. She's just not in the lab. She starts going out and interviewing people, and she starts getting herself in situations. And some of the police refer to her as maybe she goes cowboy or going solo. And, and <laughs> how, much, how much is, is there... Uh, some truth in that, that sometimes the, the forensic anthropologist needs to push the investigation a little bit, or is that, tr you know? Yeah, not so much, no. <laughs> um, and she did, that, she did that more in the early books. I mean, I do not go off digging up bodies on my own. I'm and so the, disappointed. I know, what can I say? You know? <laughs> and the police with whom I work would not appreciate me doing such a thing. I do go to crime scenes. Um, I do help in recovery, but only with an official police team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was wondering, because you, you're trying to, to be honest with the forensic anthropology. You, know, you get a sense in the books, very much so, that, that you want that science to be right. But at the same time, you, you owe it to the readers and your fans and to create a page-turning mystery. And so that puts her out there, I think, a bit more. You know, um, I read one of the recent ones, Speaking in Bones, and she does get held up at gunpoint in that one by a priest. Oh, she takes her lumps. I mean, she does take <laughs> her lumps. She's been, I can't even think she's been locked up in the basement in a morgue. I think it was cooler in Guatemala, and she's been hit over the head, and... Y'all can think of some things that happened to her. I mean, she does. That's the definition of a, of a thriller, though, versus a mystery, is there's got to be tension, and your heroine, your protagonist, has to be in positions of danger and peril, etc. But she doesn't carry a gun. Um, so you've got to think of other creative ways to get her beat up. And Well, she takes action. You know, like we were talking, we talked about gender in the, in the field, but as far as a, a woman character, she, she, at some point, she realizes, always seems to realize, I'm in peril and I have to act. If I just sit back, nothing good's gonna come here. And when she does act, she acts in a realistic way, whether, you know, she sees an opening and kicks the guy or whatever it is. And I, that's one of the things I, I think that is distinguishing about her in these books. Well, I try to keep them, not just the science, but I tried to keep every single detail accurate. I research everything. I research, because, Thriller writers are, thriller readers are sophisticated readers, and if you get anything wrong, you hear about it. I once got a three-page, single-spaced, handwritten letter from a goat farmer because I had made some comment about what goats eat. I think they were arguing about Ryan doesn't eat goat cheese, and Tempe says, do you know what goats eat? Well, I now know exactly. <laughs> Well, there, you know, there is a goat farm about a mile from here, honest, to, to re okay. so that person could be in the audience. We, you know, I don't know. Okay, okay. I, I apologize if any of the goat <laughs> farmers are here, but maybe it was, I don't know. Anyway, so I try to keep everything right. If you have her turning right on a one-way street that doesn't go that way, somebody's going to let you know. Or if you have a safety on a Glock, someone's going to let you know that Glocks don't have safeties, although they can be fitted with safeties for police departments, so I was right in that case. <laughs> so, she, she seems to meet resistance from detectives. Like, a case comes to her, and, and she sees broader implications, say, than maybe the investigating police do. And so she, she gets resistance, usually, from the male detectives. And so I, my, my question is, how much is that is, is sexism and that she's got to fight against that because the detective world seems pretty macho and how much of it is that the detectives just don't want anybody who's not a detective messing in their investigation part of it is that you have to have conflict between characters they can't have everybody just getting along and being on the same page the homicide detectives with whom first of all i'll say over my entire career and i won't say how long that is 
Um, I've never worked with a female homicide detective. Mm. Hopefully that's gotten better. Wow. Um, but the homicide detectives with whom I've worked have been nothing but appreciative of the mm. expertise. Do you get feedback? when they're not portrayed like that in the books, you know, that you, because you, you're trying to build this conflict, so sometimes the homicide detectives don't come off looking that good. Um, they can come off looking rigid, let's put it that way, let's call it rigid. Um, no, I really haven't had any negative feedback. I was really nervous about um, when the first book came out, because it is set in Montreal, and um, I used rather a lot of the characters in that book, mainly in the lab, but the cops too, um, are pretty thinly disguised. They're, you know, the people who know them know who those characters are based on. So I was a little bit worried about that. I had a, a year, uh, everyone at the lab when I started working there, it was in the 90s, I was the only English speaker at the lab. It's completely in French. So I had a year before it was translated and released in French. But, <laughs> But I was a little bit nervous when it finally did come out in French. And um, the only people that were annoyed were the people that weren't in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, they, they would come, back, come by my lab and they would say, so, you have any questions about DNA or <laughs> blood spatter? So they were very, very good natured about it. Well, Not so much at the university. It, oh, it was really? interesting. At the university, I will remember you have, I don't know how many academics are here, you have your annual review and you sit down with your review committee which gives promotions and raises and, and decides tenure, that sort of thing. And you're evaluated on your academic uh, production which is basically publications, your service and your teaching. And I remember the year that Deja Dead came out, they said, looked at me and said, and I had put it on my resume under other. They said to me, <laughs> of course, this won't count as an academic publication. <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> well, do you feel, though, that, the, well, I feel, I guess I should say, and we can find out how you feel. I, I feel that you're kind of doing a service to forensic anthropology by by bringing these stories out there and showing what the science is and showing what's popular, what, what, what's possible. Um, so I know obviously it's not gonna pass academic rigor, but you are, it seems to me, doing a service to the field. Well, when I, I think when I first wrote back in the, in the 90s, the mid 90s, most people didn't know what forensic anthropology was. And I think most people now do know what forensic anthropology is and there has been a boom in applications. Uh, to universities in, you know, in anthropology programs, particularly for forensic anthropology programs have been started at universities that didn't, didn't have that as a major before. So hopefully I've, you know, spread the word about what it is we do and also hopefully inspired women to go, in, to go into the field or to go into science in general. Mm -hmm. So well, we're talking a lot about science, but one of my favorite parts of the books is it's usually about three quarters of the way through or two thirds and there's a, a lot of facts, but they're not connecting. And Temperance will either, maybe sometimes she has a dream or sometimes she stares at a spreadsheet she's created long enough and suddenly there's a spark of intuition. There's almost something beyond pure logic that sometimes is at work to help her solve some of these things. And I just wanted to ask you, how do you know when to put that in a story? Do you do, does things like that happen to you when you're doing this kind of work that finally there's enough pieces and if you step away from it or look at it differently, it suddenly clicks? Sometimes, you know, you have that aha moment. Um, I try not to use the dream idea. First of all, my editor says, nope, we're not doing the dream. Um, but you yeah, there has in. to be something because you do have a lot of disparate facts or maybe you get that final missing piece or she see and this happens a lot on the TV show too, you know, Hodgins rushes in and he's got that hind leg of a paleolithic spider that's been extinct for, you know, 7,000 years that solves only exists in, you know, Boulder, Colorado or something. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes it's just you get that one missing fact that, that, that helps you to put it all together. So you mentioned the TV show. Um, 
So the TV shows a different, somewhat different character, some a different city. Tell us about how the genesis of that the TV show and and how you felt as it moved forward and your involvement in it and, and, and how you feel now that it's over. I feel sad that it's over. Uh, we were the longest, we are the longest running scripted drama in the history of Fox, so we're pretty proud of that. We did 246 episodes, which is a lot of episodes. It is a lot of compromised human remains to have to come up with a fresh idea every single time. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty proud of that fact. Um, I think we evolved a lot over 12 seasons. When we first made the pilot, we were so proud of ourselves, and now when we look at it, we just kind of cringe. <laughs> oh, really, no. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answered your question or not. I mean, it was very sad, because I remember designing the sets, and if you've ever watched the show, we have these sparkly, shiny, our executive producer, Barry Josephson, loves shiny big and shiny, and so he was really responsible for creating that wonderful forensic platform that they, that they go up on, and, and our permanent sets were in, um, uh, we had two huge sound stages um, on the Fox lot. So having worked for that, with that, on that, around that, for 12 years to go in right before our final episode, which was a bomb goes off, and everything is destroyed, everything is just shattered, and there are bones everywhere and everything is blackened from smoke from the bomb. I mean, that was a real shock to walk in on. I'm sure the crew had the best time ever <laughs> doing that. <laughs> well, the setting in the books, the setting of Montreal and the Charlotte, North Carolina area, is very strong, very important part of the books. But the, but the TV show was set in DC. Yeah. How did that come about? I don't know. Uh, it was available. <laughs> Those are marketing decisions. It was available. <clears throat> um, West Wing was the only show on set in DC. It was going off the air. It made sense because the main male character in the TV show was FBI. So it made sense mm -hmm. that you would have a lot of... We also had to come up with a reason the FBI would be involved in the case, if it was federal land or it was you know, this or that or whatever. So it just made a lot of sense. Also, the Jeffersonian was a very thinly veiled um, copy of the, the Smithsonian, it, which was funny. C going right up to where we had to put the logos on the, on the lab coats and on the um, rescue vehicle and all that, the Smithsonian hadn't given us permission to, to use this. They hadn't said no, but they hadn't said yes. So we had to make a decision. So we went with um, Jeffersonian. So th there were just a lot of reasons to come together to, to mm -hmm. set it in DC. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've written 20 books, you've written several novellas. So you've probably visited this world you know, 25, 30 times, whatever it is. You've got a, a character, you've got what you're doing. How do you keep a series like that? I guess I have a two part question is, how do you keep that fresh? And then I thought, is it kind of liberating because your fans, they have a certain background information already as soon as they enter the story. And so you can do shorthand rather than necessarily always have to develop everything all over again every time. So is that a liberating thing? Or do you feel constricted because, oh, you know, six books ago I said this and now I've got to make, do something with that? Well, it's both. Um, in that you do have your core cast of characters as Tempest Brennan and Andrew Ryan and her daughter and whatever. So the challenging part is that any book a reader picks up, that may be their first Temperance Brennan book. So you've got to introduce the characters and the premise. But that may be the 20th Temperance Brennan book that another reader is picking up. So you've got to do it in every single book in a new and creative way. And that's challenging. You can't just, um, and you don't want to do just straight narrative. You want, I've done it by, she's in a faculty meeting and she's bored to tears. I don't know if you've ever been to an academic <laughs> And she's bored to tears, so she starts writing her own autobiography. That's a way to introduce the character. 
or she's testifying, she's on the stand as an expert witness, and they're qualifying her as an expert witness, so they're asking questions. That's a way to do it that's new and original. So you've always got to find a new way to introduce those facts, even though it's your 20th book. Do you have to keep track of certain things, of oh. characters? I mean, do you have a giant spreadsheet? I, you know, years ago I went to um, Faulkner's house in Oxford, Mississippi, and I don't know if people have been there, but in one of the rooms is, he has, it was a novel, it's one of his later novels, which I haven't read, but on the wall are the days of the week that he wrote, everything that happens, so he could keep track on the walls around this room uh, for this book, so he would make sure that he had the things chronologically right and wasn't repeating himself, but you're 20 books in, I mean, how? Well, that's a two-part question. For every book, you have to do that. And I don't do a lot of outlining <clears throat> for the Temperance Brennan books before I write them, but I do it retroactively. After I finish a chapter, I go and I enter into an outline, chapter one, chapter two, chapter, what happened in that chapter. So if I have to go back and find something and check a date or whatever, I, I do. I can be able to go back and, and do that. Also with the series, um, you have to keep track of what's happened in the series. You know, did her father die? Is her father still alive? Is her, was her, you know, what was her grandmother's name? Or So uh, what I should have done, but didn't, of course, because you don't anticipate having that many books, is keep what's called, in TV, there's a Bible. There's like a Bible for the show, and you keep all of those factoids in the Bible so you can go back and, and check against, well, we, have we done that before? Or, and if we did it, you know. So yes, you have to do it for each book and then you have to do it for the series as a whole. Wow. I was very fascinated. And still you make mistakes. I, mean. <laughs> I was very fascinated what you said is that, that you don't outline beforehand. So do you sometimes, sometimes surprise yourself with where it's going? Like, you know, you're halfway in and, and then maybe for some reason, it turns in a way, or the characters drive it, or the suspect drives it, or something happens that, that changes, maybe surprises you. Yeah, I mean, you may, I, sometimes I'm well into, I know where it's going, and I know who did it, and I know how it's going to end. I know how it's gonna start, I know how it's going to end. But as you go along the way, yeah, you may get a great idea, and you know, you have to introduce that, which means you may have to go back and change some other things or plant something earlier that's going to make what happens later make sense. So absolutely, it's, it's not, I, I'm linear as a writer in that I, my daughter is also a writer. My, my daughter and son are both lawyers. Um, I spent $200,000 sending them to law school. Neither one practices law. <laughs> They're both writers. And my son is very linear and he puts up colored cards on a big board and outlines like crazy. My daughter, if she's in a happy mood, she writes the love scene and if she's in a sad mood, she writes the death scene. And I'm just like, oh, that's so wrong. You can't. She hops all over the place. She may write the ending before she writes, I, I can't do that, I'm very linear. So I do write chapter one, chapter two, chapter three in that sense. But it's, it's linear in that way, but it's also feedback. You're constantly, it's feedback. So as you write something, that may give you a better idea either to change the direction going forward or even go back and change something that you did previously. Did you ever have a, a case or something in real life that you possibly could have done as a book, but you thought, oh, that's either too harrowing or there's something about it that pulled you back from doing it as a book? Uh, well. Not specifically, and again, I, what I do is I take the core idea from a case and, okay, what if a woman is murdered and dismembered and it's done with a very standard type tool that uses and leaves no evidence as to identity of the tool, but the way it's done is unique? I'll start with just that core idea and then ask myself, well, okay, then what if this, or what if that, or what if that, and then spin it off into fiction. But I don't think I've specifically, purposely avoided any cases. I'll have to think about that. Mm -hmm. So you worked on 9-11 recovery. What was that experience like, and how did that affect you 
if it did emotionally or just going forward after that? Well, I haven't written about it. Um, I did do a disaster book. My fourth book, Fatal Voyage, um, is about a, a commercial airline disaster. It was terrible. I mean, it was, it was terrible. I went there with DMORT, which is the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Teams. Um, it's a federal network of teams that go in in situations of uh, mass disasters involving large numbers of human fatalities. It exists permanently, but the team will go in, the regional team will go in at the request of the locals. But 9-11 was so huge, and the, it was so hard to get, you know, you couldn't fly to New York, you couldn't rent a car to drive to New York, so they took people from whoever, demort people, whoever could get there to show up. So I did a, a deployment there. And um, we worked 13-hour shifts. It was, uh, I was part of the time at Ground Zero, but mostly at the landfill out on Staten Island. And mm -hmm. we just spent hours going through debris. And, and then there was a lot of bone because there were um, restaurants and catering services and things. So what we were doing mainly is, is uh, determining if it was human and then if it was human, everything was so fragmentary, there was no identification made there. It would just determine if it's human, and then each day the medical examiner van, we would give it a number and package it, and then they would come and pick it up. And then later, that was really DNA was the way most remains were identified. So how has, how has forensic anthropology and, and this criminal work changed in the last, you know, 20, 25 years. You know, I mean, I, all, lots of things have changed, and, but one thing I noticed reading the books is, in the first book, there's some computer work, it's a bit rudimentary, and then in Speaking in Bones, I think the last published one of, of the series, um, there's a web sleuth who sits in their house on the laptop and is like trying to solve a cold case. I mean, that's a world of difference. And, so maybe you could talk about some of those differences and just how things are done and how they affect you uh, trying to write about them. Well, I think you put your finger on it. Two, two big developments, computerization and DNA. You know, DNA is, is the big gorilla uh, in every forensic lab now. It can't solve every case. You can't use DNA in a vacuum. You have to, up until recently, it's been used for comparative purposes only. It is, you know, you have, a sample from a crime scene, and you have a suspect, can, can, and you compare them to see if they're from the same person. Um, it's now moving in the, so you couldn't use it, for example, you needed it, uh, so, okay, say I get bones, I couldn't, say I get DNA from those bones, unless I had a possible identity, we think it's Jane Doe, it was a, no good to me because I, I didn't know whose family to go to until I know we think it's Jane Doe, we can go to Jane Doe's family, we can get a sample, then we can do a comparison. Now DNA is moving in the direction, and I touch on this, um, I think in Speaking in Bones, in the direction of being predictive, in that I have DNA, and I can now use that to generate a sense of what this individual might have looked like. Hair color, facial, uh, con uh, hello, metrics, um, racial background, that kind of thing. It's moving in that direction, predictive rather than strictly comparative. So DNA is the big development in forensics. And then, of course, computerization, where you can more accurately take your measurements, take your measurements and throw them into programs and compare your unknown skull to known populations and who is it most like in a multi-dimensional metric sense. Is it Asian? Is it of African origin? Is it of European origin? That's what, I'm, I'm being very oversimplistic here. But those kinds of programs that are developing are much more facial recognition. Not to the extent that Angela used to do it with the Angelatron on the television show, but um, yeah, moving towards that. And what do you think the future, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Do, do you, what's on the horizon in this field, or is it you can't tell at this point. Well, I mean, any, anybody's guess is as good as mine. What is it, chip, cheaper, quicker, smaller? You know, DNA, instant DNA on site at a, at a body discovery kind of thing. Plus databases that have 
DNA that you can easily access for comparison. Well, we're seeing that yeah. um, with crimes. Yeah. Um, in Denver, they recently got this guy who was the, the hammer killer. It was a killer in the 70s. And you say I'm saw Grizzly? This. What? Yeah, he, yeah he, 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 he killed people with a hammer. Well, and they I never found him. Yes. And, but apparently they had some uh, DNA uh, stored away. This is from the 70s. And it matched a prisoner in Utah, I think. And they just solved that case just like a month ago. And that's because that DNA is in the system now. You know, the, the, the well, database. are these genealogy programs that you can voluntarily... Yeah bad idea if you're planning to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Think it through. <laughs> did, you, did you ever, um, do you have a favorite, I just thought of this because you're giving some advice there, do you have a favorite, <laughs> do you have a favorite killer or a favorite bad guy in, in your books? Oh, in my books? Yeah, or, or are they all just terrible? Or was there anyone that you thought, mm, maybe I could let this guy get away with it? Well, I have. Uh, let me answer it this way. Uh, I had, there was only one book in which the villain got away. Which one is that? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> um, it was the seventh one, Monday Morning, M O U R N I N G, I believe, was my seventh book, and the villain gets away. But then, in my seventeenth book, ten years later, we deal with that. Ah. <laughs> so nobody gets away for real. <laughs> Wow. All right, we're going to turn it over to questioning in just a few minutes, but I, I do have my own personal question I wanted to ask you. So what, what's going on with Temperance and Andrew Ryan? I mean, are, is this ever going to happen? Or? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I, the, I am currently working on, um, well, not right this minute, because I'm here in, in Boulder, um, a, a Temperance Brennan book. So that one should be out next year. So, because in that last book, you, you kind of kicked it down the road a little bit. I mean, well, you know. but I mean, they reached an agreement, didn't they? Wasn't that the last book? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll see if that works out. But all right, I, I, I'm. I mean, I'm. We can hear maybe from audience members. I, I'm a little ambiguous about it. I mean, she's a strong ambivalent. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm ambivalent. Um, but. You know, I, I'm just curious to see where you're going to go with it. But I'm okay either way. I just I want to let you know that. Well, are you interested in her? I mean, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm interested in her being... I think her critique of Andrew, part of it is that she doesn't want him... She doesn't feel she needs a knight in shining armor. And he can't help kind of be the knight in shining armor. And then I'm a little conflicted because, frankly, and sometimes she does need a knight in shining armor because she's going to bleed to death if somebody doesn't show up. So, but um, but I like I like her being strong and, and and independent and 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 also I'm not a big fan of long distance relationships always. So she did rescue him in uh, Death Du Jour, the second book. Oh, all right. He got shot and she rescued his ass. So. <laughs> and now we're in book 20 and they still can't quite figure it out um, alright so why don't we have some questions from the audience I'm not sure so we're going to have a mic go around is that how we do this and... okay good steal my mic and um, maybe we can lift up your hands if you have questions I don't I won't stab you Hi, Kathy. Um, we met earlier at the Is hotel. Ellen? Is that Ellen? Hi, yeah. That was really fascinating. Thank you. Um, so I'd really love to hear a little bit more about your current forensic anthropology you know, other job in the lab. Are you, do you spend much time doing that now? I actually don't spend very much time on casework. I'm available, but um, because of the demands of writing a Temperance Brennan book every year. And we didn't talk about it, but I wrote a series of young adult books with my son. We did six books. It's the Viral series, which features Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece, Tori Brennan. And um, we wanted to... Uh, 
the reason we did that is um, a lot of kids were coming to my events, and I, you know, my, and or parents would say to me, "Is it okay for my daughter to read your books?" And I'd say, "Well, how old is she?" And, and they'd say, seven. And I'd say, "No." <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so um, we wanted to. to uh, write something with a, for kids, for girls, with a strong female uh, young lady who could show girls that it's cool. Science is cool and the STEM subjects are cool and go into it. Um, also, my son hated practicing law and was desperate to get out of doing that and proposed, let's write a young adult series. Uh, so we did that. So there are six of those out there. So between writing the co-authoring, the young adult books, and, and then he dumped me. He now does his own young adult series. Um, between doing that and writing Temperance Brandon and then writing for the show and working as a producer on it, the, there just wasn't enough time. So I'm not doing very much casework these days. Sorry. Hi. Over here. Where are you? Right here. It's God. On your, on your left. <laughs> I am okay. God. Oh, way left. Oh, far right. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name's Anna. Great, great talk. I have not read any of your books, and I didn't know about uh, your field, but it's, it's very, very interesting, and, and now I'm, I'm getting interested in this character and wanting to read the books. But my question is, um, it's not about forensic anthropology. It's actually, um, I, I, have a, I have an interest... Uh, um, I want to write a story that needs to be told, and I would love for it to be on TV. So, don't know if you can help me with this, but I'm wondering if you can give me a piece of advice. What would you suggest uh, is the best way to do that? Write, write, the, write a series of books first? I would love for it to be a series, uh, a television series, because it's gonna be a long story. Um, and I want it to be on TV because I want it to reach tons and tons of people. So would you suggest writing a series of books first and then approaching producers? I mean, I, I've never done anything like this, so I wouldn't even know how to get in touch with producers and how that all works. So yeah. I know it's a, a, lot, a lot of questions, but anyway, any advice you can offer is well, greatly appreciated. For, writing for TV is really different from writing a novel. And I'm doing a panel tomorrow at when? Somebody tell me when, 6.30, 7.30, on from script to screen. It's about just that, getting your work either on TV or feature film. Um, there are books out there on how to write for TV. Um, there are books out there on how to write a novel. Um, you'll get a little bit out of each of those. It's hard for me to say to you, write a series of books, because that will take years and then you've got to manage to get those published and then I would definitely say work with an agent in either case if you decide to go literary and write your books first and right now Hollywood's buying a lot of that kind of uh, optioning a lot of characters through books um, but either way work with an agent either a literary agent if it's for books or with a television agent if it's to sell to television because it's an incredibly difficult business to break into and a complicated business and you would need representation as okay. to what they're going to be looking for on television five years down the road hard to say I have no idea okay great thank you Okay. No, go ahead. Um, just wondered if you offer a quick critique of uh, some of the other television shows, some of them that were, I, th I can't remember Jack Klugman's Quincy. television show. Quincy, Quincy, like from Quincy to Dexter. What, do you, what did you, <laughs> did you, well, yeah, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? Uh, what did you learn? or Those what you are like two didn't... different points on the spectrum. I guess Dexter did work in a forensic lab, though, right? Oh, he yeah, was he a was a blood spatter, blood spatter. Yeah. yeah, blood spatter guy. What did I think? Um, some were better than others. Um, everybody loved uh, Quincy, of course. You know, good old... back in the day, he was the first of that genre, although he didn't have that much science in the show, no. did he? He was more of a detective, wasn't yeah, he? he was 
I was much too young to watch Quincy. <laughs> so, yeah, he was a coroner. Um, some are better than others, and some uh, are, really don't care much about the accuracy of the science at all. So rather than say something negative, um, you know, if you find them entertaining, then just watch them, just watch some of them with a silo of salt, I would say. Um, my question is about more of the famous cases. Uh, the Romanov family comes to mind. Uh, Richard III, under the parking lot. Um, have you ever worked on, any, on anything like that, or do you follow those very carefully because they're so fascinating? Well, I do follow them because it's my colleagues um, that are doing them, Mike Bodden, I think, and Henry Lee, of course, um, is involved in everything. But they worked on the Romanovs. A man named Bill Maples worked on the Romanovs, I believe. I would have to double check this, but a very dear friend of mine is a forensic anthropologist here in Colorado, Dr. Diane France. She may have been involved in some way with the Romanoff thing. Um, I haven't done anything nearly that, that glamorous. Um, I worked on a case that it, I used part of the story in my second book. It's a woman named Jean LeBaire who died in 1714 and in the 90s was proposed for sainthood. So the first step in that process, if there are remains, is to verify that you've got the proper remains. So I was hired by the Catholic Church to exhume her and analyze her remains. But nothing as, as um, famous as uh, of dead, long ago dead people. I've worked on some currently dead people that got a lot of media. <laughs> but. Yeah. Pardon? Hi. So my agent kicked my book back saying, make it darker. And I grew up in a British family where not much was described and we were kind of quiet. And so I've lived a sheltered life where this isn't something I want to learn. Um, nevertheless, um, I'd like to get the book published. So um, I guess I have two questions. I'm glad to hear about your uh, teen series, since that's what mine is. And um, some good examples to possibly learn darkness. And also the second question is, how has it changed you dealing with dark? Um, let's talk about, if you don't want to write a dark book, then don't write a dark book. I think there's an audience for cozies, or whatever term you want to use for them. Everything doesn't have to be dark. And you're, did you say you're writing for children or young adults? Or? Young, it's young adults, um, Harry Potter-ish. And the series got darker as the children grew up. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where she's pushing me. But it's different for me? Well, I think you should write what you feel comfortable with and what you love. And um, it's hard for me. I mean, I really don't want to tell you what to do, but every book doesn't have to be dark. Try, you know, try the vir It's called Virals. Yeah. They're series. I'll be reading every one. <laughs> and it's got a little bit of an element of they're not zombies and they're not, what's the other one? Um, Vampires, but they have some special abilities that uh, they acquire in the first book. So you could try that one. It's not violent, totally nonviolent, and I don't, I wouldn't call it dark. Um, Harry Potter. I mean, I don't know what are the. He's also writing with Ali Condi a middle grade level series called The Dark Deep, actually, or The Deep Dark. That's one or the other. Um, but that skews a little younger. That skews to your 8 to 12-year-old market. So try a virals. You might like it. How does my line of work change me? I'm not sure it does. Um, I were all aware of the violence in the world today, in America today. What if we had three shootings in two days now? Um, I think the difference is that I see it up close and personal, you know, and I see the damage that those incidents create on the victims. Um, but I, I, it, I, you all know about it too. You read about it 
you know, on, on your t devices, or I used to always say newspapers, but that's going to make me sound old, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I was trained as a scientist, and I have to maintain that perspective um, when working on a case. Some cases are a lot more difficult than others to do that but you just have to remain um, scientific and objective or you're not going to be any good to that victim. So that's, you know, that's, that's either I've developed those abilities or I ha had that psychological makeup which allowed me to go into the field that I've chosen. You, it, oh. Well, as we, yeah, she goes off and does things that, that aren't always all that smart. So hopefully I, I don't go off investigating on my own the way she does. So she probably becomes, I work either at the crime scene with an official police group or in the lab. I was gonna ask you a question. I'm, I'm out here straight ahead. Whoop. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you are, okay. Um, I think you just sort of answered part of it, but you have been so calm and so matter of fact about the, the serial killers and the little, the little girl three weeks later, etc. And I just wondered if in your work, not your writing so much, but maybe both, have, you, have there ever been things that have just been too awful or too emotional or too heavy or um, have grossed you out in a way that isn't scientific, or is, the, is your training and, and your personality carrying you through in this sort of, the, the, the face you show, you're showing us, the calm face? Cheese skippers. You know what cheese skippers are? This is something that grosses me out. I mean, you work through it. Cheese skippers are maggots that jump. <laughs> They're little ones, and, and they, you'll be working and they'll be hopping around you or down off the autopsy table onto the floor. They kind of gross me out. <laughs> also, the, when my kids were little, the baby diapers, when it would be really kind of greenish yellow <laughs> because they ate spinach or something. So my question is, I know that a lot of science and research is really slow moving. I'm right in the middle. Gotcha. Um, a lot of science and research is really slow moving, where you're waiting for results, you're sifting through meaningless data that might, you're trying to find the one piece that is meaningful, you're following dead leads. How do you balance being accurate in your books with keeping the action moving? <laughs> It's hard for me to say how I do that. It's, an, it's instinctual. Um, one of the challenges of being a scientist writing fiction, and my publisher told me this when she was told that a manuscript was coming to her from an academic scientist, she immediately was figuring out her rejection letter because people go into an, a field because they love it. They love physics or they love, I don't know, dentistry or whatever it is they've trained so long to do. So they put way too much in, way too much detail. So to me, the challenge is you've got to keep the science, the details brief, and you've got to keep them accurate, and you've got to keep it absolutely jargon-free. You can't use all the specialized terminology we use to each other as scientists. So combining those three, it's, it's almost the same skill you use in um, addressing a jury. You don't want to dumb it down, but you want to keep their attention and you want to make, your, it, make it understandable. So I think that's the real... Um, skill that's involved in taking science and putting it into fiction. And I just write good old fashioned murder mysteries. The difference is the solutions are science driven rather than just detective legwork or gut instinct or that kind of thing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm next to the last person who was speaking. Back here. <laughs> 
Um, I do just quickly want to say that not that long ago, I was an aspiring forensic anthropologist, and that was largely due to Bones and later on your book, so thank you. Um, my question for you is, I think often in society or sometimes there's like, there's pushback about forensic anthropology being an exact science, not being an exact science, um, and blood spatter specialist, also some controversy there, so I'm wondering um, if you get that at all and how you deal with it. Well, you know, a lot of the forensic sciences came under um, investigation. Uh, I think it was 2009, the American Academy of Sciences, no. Anyway, a, a report was issued about forensics and there was a lot of fault found with many, many forensic science areas in which they were using techniques that had, were not replicable, were not validated. Um, bite mark analysis, for example, there was no way to validate. It's just, I'm an expert, I'm experienced, I've seen a lot of bite marks, so this one matches or this one doesn't match. So, and I shouldn't single them out, but that was one of them. But forensic anthropology was not um, found without fault, but, but it, it, it really didn't uh, receive the criticism that many of those other areas were. And again, it could be because we're academically based and we believe that you have to test and use standards that the next person coming along or the expert hired by opposing counsel or whatever can replicate exactly what it is you did. And I think with a lot of our techniques, you, you can do that. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But we're certainly working towards, and all the forensic sciences are working towards um, standards that can, in fact, be tested and replicated. And also, that's the reason I've mentioned board certification, and Arson mentioned board certification. It used, once forensic science became popular, somewhere back in the 90s, and we're not sure why, we worked in our labs forever and no one paid any attention to us, and then all of a sudden we were hot. So people with a degree in chemistry or psychology or anthropology began hanging out their shingle. I'm a forensic anthropologist or I'm a forensic psychologist. How do you sort out who a legitimate expert is from one who is not? And that is the point of board certification in that you have to have certain training. You have to sit for a very rigorous practical and written examination. You have to maintain annual or biannual or whatever regular continuing education requirements in order to maintain your certification. It's a way of letting the courts or law enforcement or whoever know who a legitimate expert is. So that's one of the things that's been instituted in virtually every forensic area to weed out those that, that really don't have the proper expertise. That was a long, preachy answer, wasn't it? <laughs> How involved were you in the creation of each of the shows in the series? Are you a technical consultant? Did you help write the script? How did that work? How, was that, how much involvement did I have in Bones in the series? Um, I, I'm a producer. And we've kind of poked fun at that. I think it was the episode, because on the show, Temperance Brennan's a forensic anthropologist as her day job, but her night job, her part-time job, is she writes thrillers, bestsellers, about a fictional anthropologist named Kathy Reichs. So, <laughs> yeah, so we've done two or three episodes about about that, and one of them, her book was being made into a, into a film, and she was being interviewed by Penny Marshall. And so she says to Penny Marshall, well, what is a producer anyway? What does a producer do? And Penny Marshall says, I don't know. Nobody knows what a producer does. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in Hollywood does. Anyway, I was a producer. Um, mainly, I, would, I functioned as a consultant to the writers, especially in the early years when they would have questions about the science or they would need a bone clue, as we called them, to drive um, the solution to the story. And then I also wrote episodes. I would write, co-write with my daughter, the lawyer who doesn't practice law. I would co-write an episode um, each year. So um, we're going to wrap it up. One thing I'll say, though, is in speaking in Bones, I know maybe you do it in another book, too, that Temperance 
starts talking about like there's all these web sleuths and everybody thinks they can solve crimes every because they watch shows like Bones. So then Bones gets mentioned in the book. So it's kind of like you could you, very post uh, metaphysical. I did. You know. I did. It's sort of a tongue-in-cheek reference to Bones yeah. and CSI and yeah. <laughs> So um, we have to wrap it up. Kathy will be signing books out there. We have the Bone series, but we also have the viral books that she talked about as well. So all those books are, out, are going to be out in the lobby where she can um, sign them for you. And then I'm doing a panel. And we'll talk more. The panel's on, as I said, from page to screen, or it'll be more about uh, TV and film, and I think. Yeah, I, I, well, I that, won't be there, but that's yes. That's tomorrow night sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Check the schedule. It's in your schedule. Check your schedule. I think it's, it's like there. 7 o'clock or 7.30 or something. Okay, thank you. 6.30. Okay. 6.30, okay.